Okay, so uh, this is it. All right, so just uh, uh, this is uh, the third and last lecture, right? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we survive, yes, okay. So now we are talking about, uh, we started talking about model misspecification last lecture. We discussed uh, optimal transport because that's the tool that we are using to specify um, the, the perturbations or the model misspecification, how much uh, misspecification there is and what type of misspecification is controlled by the optimal transport uh, costs. And now today I'm going to talk about applications to machine learning and, um, and the statistics. Uh, so I'm going to go to where we left off. So we talk about uh, an example. So an example in which, so I'm going to finish this example and, uh, and now move on. So the idea is that, uh, let me remind you here, what uh, we want to compute is the, the probability of bankruptcy. So that's the probability that a reserve process, is, this reserve process is modeled according to some initial reserve minus payout. This Z corresponds to payout of claims. Uh, you should think of this C, ignore this stuff. I mean, the, I, I really should be putting the norm of X minus Y, supremum norm. It's just that this is not a poly space and I need to be strict with the use of the theorem. But, but uh, you know, just throw it away. Just think of the supremum. Now, that's the X minus Y. Suppose that phi is the identity and this is the cost function, right? The point is that, uh, that uh, what I have is I'm modeling this reserve process. I have my initial reserve. I, I'm paying claim, claims out according to this process ZT. ZT is the accum cumulative payment of claims that I have paid out uh, in net pay, payout claims by time t, right? So all accumulated. And I'm interested in the ruin probability up to time one. So the ruin set is the, is ruin happens if, the, if at some point my reserve hits zero or below in the interval zero, one. And expressed in terms of Z, that's the same as saying that the maximum, the, the payout claims, aggregated payout claims at some point is larger than B. B is my initial reserve, okay? So that's the ruin, the ruin event corresponds to the maximum of this process Z being larger than B. Okay, now I remind you what we computed was uh, the formula is, uh, is you look at the distance, so let, I'm gonna say it in words. The target set, target set is all the sample paths of Z, all the sample paths of Z that hit B, okay? Now what we are going to do is uh, we are going to enlarge, enlarge that, that, uh, that set. So we enlarge the set. This, this function C of B means the following, means you look at the distance from the sample path Z to the set B. So you look at how close you are using the metric that you have, you have uh, designed or you have fixed, how close you are in based on that metric, how close is the path Z, this is an illustration of a path Z, to the set B, how close you are, right? What's the minimum amount of energy that is required to deform, change this path, and make it into a path that hits B, according to that metric? If that metric had been an, an energy function where you take the integral of everything, that would have been, you know, that would have been a calculus of variation problem that you need to solve. But my metric is just the supremum norm. Then so, it's very easy to see that the, that the cheapest way in which I can deform this path, make it into, into the cheapest cost to, to make it into a path that actually crosses B, is by looking at the maximum of the path and just move, just measure the distance from the maximum to, to B. That's the, that's the, you know, if I, if I make this, if I, if I add a, a function that is basically zero, zero here and almost in a pulse here, of this size, then right at the optimum, this is, an, this is an optimal way of moving the path, according to this notion of distance, because I'm taking the supremum, the maximum. So that means that, uh, that the distance to the, to the set is equal to, is equal to B minus the supremum. So that means that enlarging the set, making the set larger than it should be using this, like this enlargement, so all the paths that are within distance zero of the target set, well, are the paths that actually have maximum greater or equal to B. 
So if I put lambda star equal to infinity here, that I recover the event of interest, which is all the paths that are distance zero to the target set, May, namely the paths whose maximum is larger than B. So lambda star equal to zero would correspond to, to exactly believing the model 100%. Lambda star slightly larger means I, I'm enlarging the set, but because of this topology, enlargement means just removing, moving B a little bit below. And so that one, that's why this solution of this optimization problem ends up being, just don't change the measure, it's P0, don't change the model, just pretend you have less money than you have at the beginning. You, so lambda star, lambda star was uh, computed, this was the general formula for when you, when you have F functions, target functions that are indicator functions. This is the dual optimization problem. So it's a one dimensional uh, convex optimization problem in lambda. You take the derivative and you have the first order optimality condition. And so this is delta solves this fixed point equation. It will have a unique solution if CA is continuous and increasing. So, so you solve this equation, this, this thing, this is the distance from path X to set A. So in this case would be B minus the maximum positive part. So it's very well defined random variable positive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We'll see other examples, but uh, but this indicator could be could be this indicator. This set A could be really nasty set. That's you know, and uh, so yes, yes. So it can get complicated. It can be for 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 indicator functions for sets. Uh, it's as it's, it's quite tractable. You pick the class. You could also do, for example, bounds that are not sharp, but you can write the function of interest splitting in sets and take like something like the union bound and do it set by set times coefficients, for example. Approximate your function by simple functions and reduce it. That could be another way of using it, but that's not what I am going to do in the machine learning examples. I'll do it for functions that are loss functions like hinge loss, uh, uh, quantile loss, L2 loss, etc. And, uh, and so you can, okay, so that's how you compute the delta. Uh, sorry, that's how you compute lambda, lambda star. All right, so then uh, you can do it also for some uh, high dimensional examples, uh, computing the cost function. Ah, okay, so here is a, okay, so now uh, several things, right? So how do you compute delta? Well, uh, remember, so here's one way of computing delta. We're going to see another way in a few minutes. One way is that, you know, just, you can use any coupling between P0 and the true uh, that, uh, that enforces the inequality less than delta. So remember that the vast and distance is the optimal coupling. So any coupling will do. Of course, the better the coupling, the, the smaller the delta and the better your bound, okay? So there will be a problem, open problem session on Wednesday. I don't, I didn't prepare like proper open problem, but I will have them here at the end of the slides. And, and so one, one way, one interesting problem I think that, the, that uh, I think is data-driven, interesting problem for this type of machinery in a stochastic process is, suppose I give you the data and uh, you, only based on the data, figure out a good coupling between that and Brownian motion. So here is an example. Don't look at this, I mean, this, this is just a coupling. Uh, so if the data was compound Poisson, but you don't know the distribution of XK, you just know that, you just know that the arrivals were Poisson. Uh, this is an algorithm that embeds this problem, th this, uh, this stochastic process, without knowing the distribution of XK into Brownian motion. So without knowing the distribution, you get an embedding here, and this is a coupling. That's a pretty good coupling. Now you can use that coupling to estimate delta. Okay, this is what we did. So that, that's kind of interesting. This is not the score of coupling because the score of coupling would allow, you would, you would need to know the distribution of X. And here you can't. You, you have to figure out some how to randomize to get it. So that's kind of interesting. I, so remember that delta, one way is to uh, compute a coupling between the data and your, in your model. Because this is the, this is the best coupling. So just any coupling will do. Okay? So the better the coupling, the better, right? The, the, the better the delta. So one way is, for example, if, if my model is this, xk is data and the arrivals are Poisson, then this is one way of coupling that, that, that is actually, this is, this, is, this is asymptotically equivalent to the score of coupling. What do you mean random coupling? A, a, coupling, a coupling is, uh, is a joint distribution, is a joint specification. So here you have brown emotion, is, it has, is one process. This one is another process. 
And then what I do is I, I put them together. So I put them together by randomizing. Is that what you mean? I introduce some additional randomness, but you, you can see this is, this is already, this, is the, uh, this, this thing is the data, the red one. And the, the blue one is the, Brownian, is the realization of the Brownian motion that I am. Of course, you see, you see common points here, here, here. These are common points. In the middle, I know that has to be Brownian bridge, so I do it. Okay, so that's how you get this. Okay, so then, what, so once you have this uh, delta, you, like, when, what we did is we calibrated and we, we said, okay, let's say, suppose that you're, you're uh, no, no, this is about, the big picture is how to choose the cost function, right? This is a very important problem in this research agenda. This is a problem that is largely unsolved, how to pick the, the cost function, generally speaking, right? And it has to do with what do you want? You know, how, how to pick the cost function? Well, tell me for what? What's the problem you're trying to solve? If you're planning to compute, for example, probabilities of, uh, of rare events, uh, and you are using P0 as a proximal because it's convenient, it's tractable, because it's Brownian motion, then you need to inform your cost function with the features that you have left out from the real data. Real data suggests, in this, in this caricature example, real data suggests that the claims are Pareto. So you need to fix that with the cost function, and, and the right fixing is, this, uh, is putting a power here that roughly matches the tail index of the Pareto. So this could, you could use the tail with a Hill estimator, for example. Now, why wouldn't you use this uh, uh, sort of compound Poisson process? This is a caricature example, so you, would, you could use it, but it's more complicated than Brown motion. Brown motion just have explicit formula. You can calibrate lambda star. In the multidimensional examples like this, then it becomes really more complicated to use uh, things like uh, compound Poisson. So I, we did it, and then you can see that if you were to use brown emotion, so this is when, when the, you go and listen to people talking about uh, large deviations and heavy tails and don't use a light tail model to estimate relevant probabilities for a heavy tail model, they, they refer to this sort of phenomena, that uh, you can really drastically uh, underestimate the risk. Now, with this uh, robustification, even if you use that sort of light tail model, but you correct it using this cost function, then you get, a specific, you get a something that is roughly of the same order of magnitude, okay? So this is, a, now this is a, a situation, the paper contains also a situation where the, the function is not a probability, but the, is this, this also weighted by the size of the loss, and there is an optimization problem. Okay, so I'm going to move on because I really would like to get to the, I'm going to skip this very interesting application in, in online advertising. It's really interesting, but I'm sorry I don't have time to talk about it. So I'll go to this. All right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, connections to, to machine learning. So the, now we are going to move to the, to the world of statistics. I'm interested in estimating a parameter of a statistical model. And I want to think of, um, of the model misspecification this adversary that I introduced uh, with the perturbing the, 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 the baseline model, which is going to be the empirical measure here, I want to use it as a tool to explore out-of-sample performance. See, the idea is that uh, uh, if, if you have a model, a statistical model, for example, something like this, you have a linear regression model, you have yi and xi data points that you collect, and you want to fit beta, uh, one thing that you can do, of course, is to solve an a optimal least squares uh, estimator here. Okay. Now, the, the point in machine learning is that uh, what you want to do, or in general, not machine learning, but in predictive analytics, is you want to find a policy that is going to perform well out of sample. So you get, you get your data, you feed your model, and then what you want to do is you want to, you want to have good performance tomorrow. Right when you actually implement the policy, so you would like to have a policy that uh, that really performs uh, well, uh, even if you w when you perturb the data a little bit, because the reality tomorrow is going to be different from what has been in the past. So that would be the motivation of uh, of uh, introducing this uh, adversary here is allow you to get a policy that that uh, gives you robustness to uh, perturbations of the data, reasonable perturbations in the data, which is what, what you're going to face in the future. And uh, so that would be the motivation. Now, uh, this is the sort of result that, uh, that you obtain if you use 
uh, this, for example, a cost function. So it's the same. This follows, uh, you might, for those of you that uh, were not here, I think I, is, I'm sorry about, uh, for jumping back and forth, but the, I'm going to be using, so this is the result that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm going to be invoking here. Sorry about that, I'm gonna go here, yes. Uh, this this uh, duality result that says that uh, if you look at the worst case, the worst case expectation, subject to all probability models which are within delta, delta of, or according to some cost function, that is equal, there is a strong duality is equal to this uh, dual problem. Okay, so the dual, strong duality hold. So that's, that's the result that I'm going to explain underlies the, the um, equivalence between linear regression and uh, the distribution of robust linear regression and, and uh, uh, lasso, okay? So if, like what I have taken here is I take this uh, supermoon over the expectations, you can square it here, uh, and you have this cost function here, now it's no, longer a, it's no longer an indicator function, it's no longer a probability, it's a, it's a, it's a quadratic loss. So now se several details to note here, like first one is, uh, you, you see here the cost function, ignore the infinity at the moment, I'll come back to this thing. Um, you, have, you have the square of the LQ distance, and what you see here is the regularization on beta appearing with the LP. So there is a dual, the, the, the P, the norm here that appears is dual to the, to the cost that I use for the transporter. So the cost function, I call this, this cost is the cost of the transporter. So the, I'm, this is the type of attributes I'm giving, the, I'm giving the transporter to move things around. And then that gives, that implies a regularization of this, of this uh, form. There is a delta here, which is the amount of, uh, the amount of perturbation that I allow to the transporter. And that pops up here as, as a square root of delta. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the regularization parameter in this form uh, of, of, uh, of linear regression with, a, with penalty. This is, by the way, called the square root lasso. And uh, there is another thing. Yeah, there's infinity here. This is a linear regression problem. Ah, okay, so I will go there, yes. So now, y, y equal to y prime. Um, I, ch I have chosen this cost function because I want to get exact recovery of the square root lasso. So if I pick this uh, cost function, then I get the exact recovery of square root lasso. It's, I just want to have exactly what, uh, what the statisticians use and interpret it as what, do you, what, what is it that they are assuming in terms of perturbations of the data when they use this. Then the next question is how to make it better, why maybe change this, do something else. But all what I'm saying is that if you use a square root lasso, that's equivalent as having an adversary and you are telling your adversary, I don't have distributional uncertainty in Y. Don't perturb Y. I don't want you to perturb Y. Just perturb X. Right? So you put an infinite cost to move the outcome of Y. The interpretation perhaps could be that uh, since you are believing the linear regression model and you are already perturbing X, then you already that, that the linear regression uh, link already is perturbing Y and you don't want to double count. Yes. Yeah, it's already, yes. It's already counted by perturbing X because these are linked by a linear regression model, so don't need to count it extra. But uh, maybe, could be the case that uh, you have some measurement error when you actually look at the y that cannot be explained by x and cannot be explained by epsilon. It's just, you know, y equal to beta transpose x, you know, beta transpose x plus epsilon is true, but uh, epsilon is not accounting for their measurement error, and in that case, you probably, you should be probably adding something here, okay? Very good question. I, uh, for, I'll tell you, um, when the loss function, when the loss function is Lipschitz, which is not this case, right? But when it's Lipschitz, for example, hinge loss or logistic regression, the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. So now the other thing is, so if you look at this term, you can say, you can say, okay, wait. Well, yes, that's kind of cool, but uh, but we knew this. I mean, in the end, you can ignore you can ignore this the adversary and this distribution robust. Uh, we know this is good. So we just go with our lives like that. We don't need you, thank you very much, leave the room, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one thing here with this, uh, with this stuff is that uh, uh, you actually get information about the worst case adversary. 
So this, there is a, for, to compute this, this max, there is an arc max here, which is the worst case adversary. And that actually, <laughs> you know, 2011, and then you, oh, this is lasso has been around so since, you know, more than 20 years now. Yeah? And, uh, but, uh, but now there are recently examples in machine learning and AI that uh, have, where, where people have started to notice that if you perturb the data a little bit in AI, you can flip uh, the prediction dramatically. Well, that has to do a lot with this worst case adversary. So you get that type of insight. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that later. So, so one thing at this moment you probably have in your mind is how come, how come that uh, you, get, you get this duality, like wh why? Well, I, well I, I didn't try too hard, uh, but uh, the reason I wanted the square root lasso is because uh, I want the cancellation of the, later on, yes. Later on, I want to tell you how to estimate. So later on, I want to ignore the theory of, uh, of statistics of how to choose the regularization parameter. And what I want to do is I want to use this right, left-hand side and use this interpretation to pick an optimal way of choosing the regularization parameter and then compare it with the lasso guys and say, ta-da, it's the same thing or better. Okay, so that's uh, why I pick it because this one is considered to be kind of the best. Can you use, uh, for example, something here that has a... a oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah, this is the likelihood of the Gaussian. But uh, yes, you could do... C, X, Y. So you, you mean informing, picking C, using information about likelihood? Yeah, I mean, in this case... So that, that, that would be... This is a particular case of what you are saying, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you are saying more generally? generally yeah. I think you could, yes. In general, the loss, yes. Okay, so I'm going to, so what I, so at this moment you probably are thinking, okay, wait, uh, how come you have this? Uh, by, by the way, you can also record, well, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But basically you have a norm here, this one has to be the dual norm. The dual norm in the sense of holder inequality, you will see that. There is a reason for that. So you want to, I'm going to show you that this is one thing that you probably have in mind. Like, you know, if, if I was looking at the result for the first time, I would be thinking, how come? Like this is, I want to know why. So I'll tell you why, okay? Oh, see, this is another example. So this is a, an example of logistic regression. So for those of you who do not know, do not know what is logistic regression, well, that's a model, that's a generalized uh, a linear model in which uh, the, the response is a label, one or minus one, and, the, and the, what you uh, set is this uh, logistic ratio, so the, the odds ratio between the likelihood of being labeled one or minus one, given the observation that you postulate equal, that is uh, exponential of beta transpose x. And so that leads, uh, that gives rise to this sort of like, a, you know, probability of y equal to one, y minus one of this form. And now what you can do is what Sandeep was saying, like you can look at the likelihood, maximum likelihood, and, uh, and estimate beta based on maximum likelihood, or, or the log likelihood. Uh, and so once you do that, uh, you end up with uh, this formulation, Right, so where you have data yi and xi's, and what you can do is the same. Uh, you can, uh, you know, estimate according to uh, empirical risk minimization, but you can also introduce your adversary right here. And if you introduce the adversary, again, you have an LQ uh, cost of transportation, so the adversary is endowed with this attribute where you measure with LQ the cost of moving mass around. Uh, the reason, again, is this infinity is because I don't want, I want to have exact recovery, right? And, uh, and now you see something interesting here is that you, you don't see the power two here, you see power one. And, uh, but you get exactly the same, the same uh, identification. Now the regularization parameter is exactly the distance. Do you have group lasso? Yes, we have group lasso. So, um, we have support vector machines, for example, is the same. Like you, you have, this is a, a the, the, the characteristic of this is, is a Lipschitz loss. And we, whenever you have a convex Lipschitz loss, we'll always have a, a spit out the regularization parameter. Uh, you can do group lasso. Thanks for the question. <laughs> so it's there, right? You can do rich, adaptive, uh, uh, rich. Uh, you can actually do semi-supervised learning. Elastic nets, uh, I have a check, but <laughs> at some point, like we, you know. Uh, but uh, some, we can do something I think is kind of cool. Uh, Semi-supervised learning, for example, you can do semi-supervised learning for things like this. How would you do that? Um, you would, 
uh, inform that uh, the adversary is allowed to move Excess only on the for the unlabeled data. So you have data that is labeled and data that is unlabeled, and typically you have lots and lots of unlabeled data. Well, you can you can use the unlabeled data to inform where the support is. You remember, like it's something that I didn't tell you was when I postulated this, I have complete freedom of where my support was, and so now I can say the support is data driven based on the labeled uh, example, the unlabeled examples, and this is what this paper does there. And the asymptotics for the statistics of the delta, the optimal choice of delta, you know, become very interesting. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. All right, so, so I told you I was going to give you a connection between, between this way of kind of thinking about these problems and these adversarial examples that you are seeing recently in neural networks. Yes. For these examples, they have been studied so much that it's hard to tell, right? I mean, I will show you uh, like what exists in, in statistics, for example, for lasso, are criterions like uh, sufficient criterions for recovery, for example, right? Um, now, this is just a criterion. Like I, I can give you another optimization problem that, uh, for example, the regularization parameter has to, achieve, has to uh, satisfy to enforce some recovery. And according to my criterion, I get I get something optimal and the other thing is not optimal, but, but this is just constants. The rates are the same. So currently, at the moment, what, uh, what we are doing is um, we are kind of trying to move away from these li linear models, try to do other models that, uh, for which, um, or, or maybe linear models where you have information and you, it's not very clear how to use the information uh, for these estimators. For example, uh, I'll tell you, let me give you an example. Geez, I mean, I wish I, well, anyway, I, I can tell you something like that. Okay. So an, a typical application that is uh, occupying my time now is, for example, a portfolio optimization. Portfolio optimization involves a linear decision rule. So it's, it's like beta transpose X. X is the returns of your assets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what you know, so you have information from the past in terms of the returns, but you also have information now in terms of the stochastic volatility implied by the call options, and that gives you an insight into the future. So now you could, you could use that to inform the cost function, to say that the adversary, okay, explore movements in this direction, not movements in these directions, and so on. Now, this is really not a statistics for on, only, right? It's a statistics and a plus some, some economics and something. So, I, I, I believe this is better, but I don't have the right technology to kind of like say, until, you know, not, not yet. Okay, so I, we are doing that, but um, at the moment, at the moment, yes, you're, you're right. Like what, what I'm presenting here is basically reinterpretations, and, uh, and the, but these reinterpretations are giving rise to, to new methods for, for, for example, adversarial training, which is what I'm going to explain now. So that's a new. And, uh, and uh, you, you certainly can get new estimators, but, it's, uh, but you know, for these linear models, it's so well studied that it's hard to actually see where. But there, I have some ideas of how to make it precise, but not, not, this is maybe like next year. Okay, so, so now the, I'm going to link this uh, worst case adversary choice to, you know, I told you, okay, so you can kick me out of the room, but wait a second, I mean, I can give you some information about the worst case adversary, right? And you, maybe you say, okay, maybe that's interesting, tell us a little bit more about it. Okay, why, why would you care? Like, this is a type, this is a, a picture that became uh, very famous, like if you Google Panda and Deep Neural Networks, you are going to get this hit. So this shows a, a network, this shows the, the, an example uh, that was uh, obtained uh, you know, was used to train a network, a uh, deep neural network for classification, right? A very good state of the art, at that time at least. But I think it wasn't, you know, probably still pretty good. So in that, uh, e that uh, network, this is a data, this is an example in the training set. Okay? In the training set, it's classified as a panda, fairly confident, this guy is a panda, we all agree it's a panda, you know, not very impressive. Then what these guys did is they created this uh, perturbation so they added this type of noise to, the, to this uh, picture, and this noise looks something like that. This j is the loss, the loss function that they use to train the neural network. 
X is the example Y, and Y is the, is the classification, panda, cat, whatever. Y is the output, and X is the covariate. And this is the sign thing of the gradient. So sign entry by entry, a small perturbation, tiny perturbation, you get something that to any human being would look like a panda, right? But now the, the machine is fairly certain it's not a panda, it's, a, it's an ape. Right, it's some, it's some sort of a, it's a, a gibbon is an ape, it doesn't, believe me, it doesn't look like a panda at all. You would tell this is not a panda. So, uh, but and it's fairly, fairly confident, right? So what, uh, what for example, this machinery allows to, to do is, to, is two things. First, it allows to explain uh, what is going on, why this is so damaging. And second, how to train and immunize the training procedure to, to um, forbid these types of examples to be damaging. So immunize against these examples. And, uh, and uh, you also, this has become quite uh, common. You see this other, you know, uh, there has been since that paper, lots of other papers that, that look at, you know, have pointed out to this phenomena that you take these neural networks and you add tiny variations uh, and then they, they completely mis misclassify the individual. This guy, for example, gets mapped into this lady this lady goes into this guy. Now it's the, the machine thinks it's this guy, this person. And uh, this person now, he, according to the machine, looks a lot like this guy. Right? So you can, you can attack and just sort of create these things. So it's, it's kind of important to immunize against attacks. Like this is an interesting, uh, like I guess this man didn't know that if he had been wearing these glasses, he wouldn't have been caught by the artificial intelligence machines in the in that this was a concert with sixty thousand people, right? And the guy, the machines recognized him, and in this sea of sixty thousand people, the Chinese police were able to grab him. Right? So he should just have shown up with a glass like that, and... <laughs> right? Yeah, or maybe maybe you know in this with these futuristic movies that your girlfriend becomes like a machine. You can look like Brad Pitt if you wear something like that. You don't have to. It's much cheaper than a, much cheaper than a surgery, right? <laughs> According to her, right? It's you know the the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? <laughs> okay, okay. So I, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain. I'm going to work out a little example, not fully, but just enough so that you can see uh, uh, why, why you have the duality, okay? So just enough to see why do you have the duality. And, the, and remember, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this, uh, this uh, robust performance analysis, ROPA duality, right? So it says that if I look, and I'm going to do it in the case where I, I don't have the infinity. It's a nuisance, the infinity. It's just, just for you to see why do you have the duality. Right? So, so in this case, I'm going to actually add this one here so that you can I have a nice sort of linear form here. Okay? So I'm interested in this uh, max over the expected value of a function of my randomness. And the, the duality theorem tells me that this is the minimum lambda times delta and this expected value, and you have the soup. The soup, what it's going to do is, is allow to compute the worst case worst case loss, but have a penalty. You, you penalize according to the distance, right? So you, you pay a price uh, for moving things around. Okay. So we are going to, I'm going to concentrate on what is going on inside. Yes, this is very la long display, so I'm going to go to just this part here. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I, I'm going to introduce this delta, which is the amount, is the vector in which, uh, of displacement. And I'm going to represent uh, everything else in terms of delta. So this guy is delta here, delta square. And I have uh, this uh, x, x times y. I split this because uh, this uh, x prime becomes x plus delta, right? X plus delta, so this is x. And, uh, or uh, x minus delta, sorry. X minus delta here. And I put it on the other side and delta on the other side. is minus. So I have the delta here. Okay. So now let's think a little bit what's going on from here to here. Uh, you see this quadratic loss is symmetric around the origin, right? I can pick the, signs of, the sign of delta in any way I want, and there is no penalty by choosing the sign. So, so if this x times y was negative, I can pick delta to be positive, and I go in that direction. Right? So, so basically, um, this, I, have a, I have this loss function which is symmetric, so this is loss of z, 
Um, and, uh, and I have a constant here that, that could be A, right? So L, loss of Z is equal to Z squared here, right? And A is going to be X transpose beta. And my loss is, is like that. So what I can do here is, uh, it doesn't matter if, I, if A is negative or positive, what I want to do is I want to increase the loss. So I want to move to this direction, or if A is here, then I want to move, go in that direction, right? So to me, this, this, this distance, this is the movement, that, this is represented by delta. I'm going in that direction, or this direction. So I can pick the sign of A. And I have no, I, I don't pay any penalty by picking the size, this, the sign of delta, because it's going to take, it's going to be a square. So in the end, what I'm, what I'm going to do is, it doesn't matter where it goes here, so the, the worst case value for this part is always going to be the absolute value, because I can always match, and it gets a square. Now, I want to go as fast as I can in the right direction. So, so this thing is going to be maximized if I pick a delta, which is parallel to beta. And parallel means that, uh, that parallel according to this geometry, the one that, the, the one that corresponds to the penalty. So that's why you get this duality. That's why you, whatever you put here has to be the dual vector of, uh, of, uh, of the cost. So that's why this should be delta, um, delta P here, the, the, the P norm of the, of, the, of the gradient. Okay, that's why. So, so in the end, you, whenever you have a, a, fun, a norm or a function, a penalty cost function, that is uh, homogeneous, so x minus y, uh, for, which for which Helder inequality holds with equality, and you can compute a dual norm, that's what you're going to have as penalty. So that's how you recover this uh, group lasso. You just think very carefully about the norm that, so that you can compute the dual. That's how you recover the, um, the rich regression. You think very carefully about the norm so that you can compute the dual, and that's, that's how it goes. And then once you have this, it's just a one-dimensional optimization problem. I'm not going to bore you, right? How, uh, but, uh, but okay, what is important is the, the worst case adversary. This is the munch map. There is a munch map between the empirical measure and the worst case measure. And that munch map in this case is given by the solution of this problem. So this is going to have a unique solution because of convexity once the lambda is chosen in the right way. And that solution is going to tell you what's the worst case adversary. So what is the worst case adversary doing? He's going to take x, right, the point x, y, and he's going to move a distance, which is, uh, which is going to be uh, delta, or uh, x, uh, the negative minus delta, right? So you just solve for x prime, x prime equal to x minus delta. So you look at the delta, and delta is going to be parallel to this beta times 1, and it's going to move in a specific magnitude, and that's the worst case adversary. Every point x in the cloud whoosh, gets moved like that. Yes. You need to, you know, uh, compute the, the beta. Okay, so let, here is an example. This is a little, it's, just bear with me with a second. This is a fully, completely, this is a bit of a mess to work out this. It's an easy calculus, but it's not something I can do in one slide. So let's, let's do this one so that you can see why Whenever you, have, whenever you have a loss function that is uh, Lipschitz and convex, you will always get regularization. This is, this is basically the example. So again, you use this uh, ROPA result, the duality result. You have this lambda. Okay, so you do exactly the same uh, as before. Here you have, uh, I, I do a change of variables with a delta. That's exactly the same I did before. And now again, this y could be 1 or minus 1. So, and, and I'm going to go, I always can make sure there is no price for me to pay for the, for the penalty of the delta. So I can always go in the direction that is more convenient. And this one, this loss is not, is not symmetric like this one I have. It's, it is a hinge loss. So I'm going to go in the positive direction. It's going to be convenient. So I always make sure that this is positive because I pick the sign of delta and I go in the positive direction. Now this thing here, um, uh, now uh, again I go in the maximum increase, that's why I look at the dual variable. And now this problem here is a linear programming problem. So I just, uh, I just need to think what's the, this guy. Of course he wants to minimize, 
So he will never pick lambda less than this norm of beta, because if he pick lambda less, then this guy who wants to maximize is gonna go to infinity. So that forces the outer guy to pick lambda larger than this. So lambda is now of this form. Now, uh, for this thing, is now a linear programming problem where lambda is exactly of this form. And the solution is uh, achieved in the extremes, either infinity, but this lambda is larger than this value, so that's not gonna be a good solution, or lambda equal to zero, and then you recover this. So now he wants to minimize lambda. The smallest lambda is the norm of beta, so that's why you get this. Okay, so, so basically, yeah, so it's, uh, it just becomes a linear programming. Now, the interpretation of the worst case distribution. Uh, so delta, delta is fixed. So where, ah, so for this big delta, right? So it's an LP, right? You're maximizing that LP in, in the, re, the region, the feasible region is delta greater than zero. That's a constant now. It's a, it's a one dimensional thing. So it's a, sorry? Ah, uh, this one. Ah, this, this should be a delta, sorry. This should be a delta. Ah, uh, this is perhaps the confusion. Yeah, this should be a delta here, delta. Uh, my apologies. Thank you, Remco. Yes. Okay, so, yeah, so that's the, that's the thing. Now, the, 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 the correct interpretation, this is a very interesting case. Uh, the correct interpretation here is not that the worst case adversary moves zero. The correct interpretation is that there is no worst case adversary. The worst case adversary, actually what it does, is, uh, is uh, chops a, a, a mass of size epsilon and moves the mass by an amount that is of order one over epsilon. And you get something that is epsilon optimal. And you, by sending epsilon to zero, you reach the optimal value. So this uh, worst case adversary basically is just uh, getting everything intact and just picking epsilon mass from all of the data points and just moving them away a distance of order one over epsilon in the right direction. Okay, um, okay, so now what's the connection? Why these guys have this, uh, wh why this thing here? Now you probably can see why this, why this thing here. Because this is the worst case adversary. You see, whenever you have, whenever you have something that is uh, a loss, general loss function, uh, you are going to, uh, you apply this robust duality result and uh, you need to think now that uh, lambda, if, if delta is tiny perturbation, lambda is the Lagrange multiplier, so the shadow price would be really high. And once you do that uh, sort of rescaling and you do a Taylor expansion around what's the, what's the Munch map, what's the worst case adversary, the, the Munch map associated to the worst case adversary, after a Taylor expansion, you see that you get the gradient of the loss and the dual vector, vector corresponding to the transporter. So if you have picked the the, the um, L1, right, then the dual vector is going to be the sign, or L infinity transporter, then the dual vector is going to be the sign, and that's why you get these guys, what they have chosen is a, is a, um, a transporter that is an L infinity transporter, and they are uh, perturbing according to the solution of the worst case transporter for a delta that is very small. Okay, so how do you then, uh, Yes. Well, what they did is, what they did is they ignore this. <laughs> they just say like, I want to damage this guy as much as possible. So they say like, I want to change my example in such a way that I maximize the loss for that particular example, subject to the L infinity constraint here, and that's equivalent to a penalty. Right? So the example by example. So there is no, that, uh, that, that, that is not, I mean, if you want to, for example, now have a way to, to, to cure that problem, then you can do this. For example, do this training. Uh, then uh, what you can do is take this example and, and compute lambda that is very large, corresponding to delta really small. And now uh, if lambda is very large, for large enough lambda, this is a concave optimization problem. You can, you can do uh, your uh, training like that. This is not how they do the training, though. But this, is, this actually works. Now, the advantage of this sort of thing is uh, you can compute delta in a statistical principle way, and I, and I want to spend time doing that. So the, what, they, what the Goodfellow and, uh, and co-authors in that paper, what they did was they created lots of examples of... What do you suggest is the following. 
uh, just, uh, just uh, train like this. Train like this, and uh, you can apply gradient descent. You can, if lambda is sufficiently large, you can apply, you can use uh, uh, the envelope theorem to compute the gradient here. Uh, you would need to solve this optimization problem fast. But this is a maximization, if lambda is large enough, this is a maximization of a concave function. So this, you could do alternating this, mean few steps of this and then go like this, few steps of this and go like this. And this, is, uh, this has been tested empirically by John Ducci and, and uh, Sin Han Hong. Um, so this, this actually works, uh, it's actually faster because they, what they do is they, they are attempt to train uh, these examples x by x, like they, they compute this x by x instead of only when you need it in the stochastic gradient descent. The, the maximization here is with respect to a small x. No, 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 no. This uh, x depends on, depends on this capital X. Yes, yes, yes. For no, 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 no. Because uh, this this little x depends on the for every for every training set. This is the Munch map, remember? So, so, so the Munch map is like for every outcome. I tell you what to do. Tell me what's the outcome, and I give you the rule to move. But it's outcome by outcome. So the x prime, this this little x is the is the Munch map. Is the where where does it go depending on the outcome you you are seeing? So in the, in the stochastic gradient descent, you would sample uh, an example, you would sample a, a, an image, an image, and for that image, you would solve this, this uh, convex optimization problem to compute the x prime. And uh, you, would, you would compute the gradient, which would be the gradient of this uh, quantity here, and evaluate, evaluate uh, x at x prime. So you compute this gradient as a function of theta, as a function of theta, because you want to train the network, Computers of theta, and you evaluate the, the Munch x prime. And then you carry on. So you did this n times. Sorry? So n samples, you did this optimization n times. For the, well, stochastic gradient descent. I mean, you do it until convergence, right? So that's the case, right? So if you do LP, LQ, uh, then the, the dual vector is signed precisely when you pick q equal to uh, infinity. Okay, so this is the explanation that I just gave. Okay, so this is, okay, so now other, uh, the a role of uh, transport cost, um, you, you can do other things, like this is the way we are doing, we are informing the, 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 the transporter yeah, using information from the market, using Mahalanobis distance, for example, and the dual norm is this A inverse. Okay, so I want to now go to uh, talk about this part, at least a little bit, okay. So now what I want to do is I want to tell you how to pick the cost function, right? Using this approach for these examples, and in general, um, a sort of a systematic approach for not picking the cost function, I'm sorry, for picking delta. So let me explain. I'm going to give you a statistical principle way for selecting delta which is the size of uncertainty in an optimal way, that will imply choosing regularization parameter in an optimal way. And there is a very rich statistical theory that, that for the specific examples of linear regression or generalized linear models tells you how to pick delta for that type of regularization. What I'm, explain, what I'm going to explain here is, going up, is applicable to any optimization problem, not necessarily linear regression, okay? But when it's a criterion that is different, I believe it's a sensible criterion as well. So at least in the case of linear regressions, we can compare this criterion of choosing delta against this sufficient condition in statistics, high dimensional statistics. Um, so to, to fix ideas, I'm gonna concentrate on the linear regression example just because to be very specific, right? Uh, so we know that that uh, you know you have this representation, so you have you know you can you can think think of choosing delta as a statistical problem, and go back to the statistics uh, literature. But I'm I'm going to ignore that, and I'm going to go back to this representation, and I'm going to formulate a problem 
that is motivated by this representation on the left hand side. Okay. Okay, so one way to do it is to select, to pick delta in such a way that you cover the true, the true parameter, right? Uh, the, the true distribution here. Um, that unfortunately is going to be, that, that is a really bad idea because uh, that, this uh, estimating empirically the Wasserstein distance doesn't scale very nicely with the dimension. So we are going to ditch, ditch that idea. So that scales like n to the minus one over d, that's not good. Doesn't make any sense. Okay, so this is, this is really not sensible. So uh, another idea, which is what I'm going to be advocating, is, is the following, it's very simple. Let's think, well, let's think about making the right decision, even if we get the wrong model. So in the end, if the model is good enough to help me make the right decision, that's okay. If the model has the right characteristics that, that are useful for the decision-making problems, that's what I want. If the model is incorrect for other things that are irrelevant for the decision-making problem, who cares? This is the way I go. We go, everybody, with our lives. This is exactly how we model things. So what I'm going to do, instead of thinking about making sure that delta is large enough so that I have the, the true model there, I'm going to project the space from the space of models, I'm going to project to the space of decisions. So for any model P that I have here, I'm going to, I'm going to imagine I, pay, I make a decision. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to imagine I make a decision, right? So if I make a decision, then I solve this, this should be a square here, my apologies. So it's the, for every model P, I compute the opti optimizer, the base decision. And now, instead of talking about models, I have decisions, okay? Now what I'm going to do, so if, if delta is well chosen, then every model here that was, was a reasonable variation of the data for the purpose of computing the decision. And therefore, if for every delta, all, the, all of these models imply plausible estimates of the decision. So all of this, if delta is well chosen, this set corresponds to a set of plausible estimates of the decision, okay? Now this set, in some sense, is the natural confidence region induced by my formulation. If I really believe that that's how the cost function should be chosen, the shape of the cost function, if I don't question the shape of the cost function, if the cost function of the adversary has those attributes, then given that information, this I claim is a natural confidence region induced by that formulation. So I can look at this confidence region now, this is increasing in delta. The larger delta, the more models I have and so the higher, the, the larger the confidence region. So the optimization problem I'm going to pr propose is minimize delta, subject to the constraint that this confidence region covers the true parameter with a, with a high degree of confidence, 95% confidence. So it's just minimize, minimize delta, subject to the probability that beta star is in this parameter set with probability one minus alpha. Okay, so this P corresponds to the randomness in this PN. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Just, uh, I'm not gonna have more time, but I think I need to finish this, the, the thought, okay? All right, so now let's, let's think about, uh, this problem looks, uh, looks very complicated, and it is very complicated. That's a chance constraint optimization problem. So instead what I'm going to do, I'm going to rephrase this problem just in simple words, okay? I'm going to look at um, what, uh, what are the probability models that make, make beta star, so what is the set, the set piece of models uh, such that um, beta star is optimal decision for P. Okay, well that's the same as the set of P's such that the gradient of the expected value under P of uh, Y minus beta star X, X transpose times beta star square, that's equal to zero. That's the set, this is a manifold of probability measures, right? So these are the set, all of, this, all of these measures are somewhere here and they satisfy this uh, linear constraint. So what I'm going to do is, if, I, if you can think of this problem, you see, if you think of this problem, I want 
I want to make sure that my, my set of uh, decisions that are plausible cover the beta star. Actually, uh, that's equivalent to saying the following. I have Pn, Pn is somewhere here. Pn is not going to make beta star optimal. That's very unlikely, right? that's not gonna happen. So what I, what I can look is I, I claim that if I compute the distance, the distance between Pn and this manifold, and I call that Rn of base, beta star, then this problem, this, is, this quantity is, is the same as the probability that this distance is uh, less or equal to delta, okay? So let's just uh, think why, right? If this distance is less or equal to delta, right, then there is one model that is within delta, namely the optimal model, for example, that is within delta of Pn, and for which beta star is the correct decision. So therefore, therefore this uh, beta star has to be in this set. And this is an if and only if statement. So the question now becomes now analyze this, this statistic, uh, which, is, uh, which is basically, you see it's like the distance from Pn to a manifold, linear manifold. This extends the Wasserstein distance. If this linear manifold involves every, all test functions, then I recover the Wasserstein distance. So this is an enlargement. And it turns out that, uh, uh, so that's the picture. For example, for this model, you can, you get a convergence to a statistic that you can compute in closed form. You can massage the statistic and obtain an upper bound, a stochastic upper bound. And if you look at the quanta, so what will be the prescription of delta, just to be, make sure that we are on the same page. Delta, if, uh, if, n, if n times r n of beta star converges to L1, the way you should pick delta is the following. First, compute the quantile of L1, the one minus, so let z1 minus alpha be the one minus alpha quantile of L1, and divide by n, and that's your delta, right? So you put this here, and you want the quantile of r n, this one, this one to be one minus alpha, so you just uh, multiply by n in both sides. So the quantile of Rn is the quantile of this L1 divided by n. Okay. With this, uh, uh, asymptote, with this stochastic upper bound for the limit, what we did is we computed the quantile. And uh, now this is a, this, uh, this is a, we compare with the, with, in the dimension going to infinity, like computing the quantile of this tractable random variable. And we obtain that the same scaling as the high dimensional statistics scale, right? But there is, a, there is a little inefficiency here. According to this criterion, that one wouldn't be optimal because this is just an upper bound. Okay. All right, so I think uh, this, this turns out to be related to what is called the profile likelihood function and empirical likelihood. But the methods to analyze this, uh, this uh, object are very different because, because of the linear programming. This is an infinite dimension LP. So again, you don't have a smoothness, you have kinks, and, and that makes it different. You get completely different types of scalings, but, uh, but this philosophy, I think, was extremely helpful to actually learn that from art. Um, I don't think I don't have time to explain why it works. I'm just going to uh, talk about conclusions. Oh yes, this idea, there is nothing special about, yeah, this, this in the end, if you have a function, you can delete this gradient and just, this could be a, a hypothesis testing problem where you have linear functionals of the, of the probability measure, for example. Um, if it's, uh, yeah, you can apply it in the context of optimization. All right, so what will we talk about in these uh, three, uh, lectures, we talk about optimal transport, we talk about applications of optimal transport and economics. That gave you, I hope, a lot of intuition of what the worst case, uh, eventually the worst case adversary is doing. It's just doing a much map in these examples with respect to the empirical measure according to some gradient. Uh, so we have used optimal transport to quantify uh, model error in the in path space for Brownian motion, in the linear regression models, uh, uh, reinterpreting estimators and uh, providing also a statistical 
criteria to choose regularization parameters. I think that there, is, there are lots of interesting open questions uh, in this area. I'll be happy to talk about them in the session, for example, that we'll have tomorrow. And I think that's it.